the window of faith. Lord, I thank you for your presence this morning. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our anointing. Lord, I don't have to pray down an anointing upon my word or my message because you are the unction. You are the anointing. And the anointed one abides. And the anointed one gives us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to speak your mind in the mind of Christ, that we will be transformed and encouraged and challenged by the word because it comes from your heart. We are only channels, we're only vessels, and we pray, Lord, that you do speak clearly this morning. Give me a fluency of your spirit, not of my own, but because you, Holy Spirit, are fluent, and you are my unction and the anointing in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> You've heard of the window of opportunity. That window of opportunity represents the most opportune, the best time in which to take action. Talking to you, though, about another kind of window, it's called the window of faith. I want to deal with that this morning. You know, it, it, the Holy Spirit, when it comes to the window of faith, operates in a whole different realm. He, he doesn't need uh, op, optimum uh, situation. He doesn't need a, a time when it seems to the flesh the moment to act and the moment to move. He's in a whole different realm. He doesn't work in that realm. I'm reminded of my trip to Russia. I had received, uh, I mean, we received regularly emails from Russia and Ukraine and all, all over the world, but especially in Russia now, <clears throat> because things are tightening. And I think it was seven, eight years ago, I held, <clears throat> we held a minister's conference in Moscow, and it came from around Russia and Siberia. And in the middle of the conference, I broke down and couldn't preach. I just wept in front of the men, and I didn't know why. The place was full, and there were hundreds. And uh, <clears throat> the next day, we had a meeting of all the key bishops. And uh, most of these bishops, and at least 17 of them, had been in prison. They had all read my book across the switchblade, page by page. They had been passed around the whole Russian prison system, because Bibles were for, for, forbidden in those days, and my book had been banned, and uh, there were other books, but many of them were saved, and some called to preach through reading the cross and switchblade. And I, I, I apologized to the minister. I said, I don't know why I broke down, I don't know why I was crying. And they said, can we answer? We were talking about it last night. We'll tell you why. God sent you here to weep over us because the, the window of opportunity is closing. And you know, I, I, I thought about that, and, and I, the Holy Spirit's been speaking so clearly to my heart that that's not how God works. You see, the window of faith, uh, the, the, the most opportune time was back when they were in prison. Because you see, the children of Israel, when they were prospered and, and blessed, and they were given houses and lands that they didn't build and vineyards they didn't plant, they grew fat, and they, they grew lazy, and they grew spiritually blind. Because, you know, in the flesh, everything was uh, opportunity. Everything was open. That, that seems, and it's what we would call in the flesh, in, in human senses, that's the window of opportunity. But God doesn't work that way. God works differently. The window of faith is that time when God wants us to believe and in his kingdom and in his mind, this is the opportune time. When every door is closing, when humanly it's impossible to do anything in the flesh. There's a principle in the Bible, and I find it all through the word of God. I could take you, if I had time, I'm not going to preach that direction, but there's a principle that when God makes a promise... When, when you pray and God puts a word in your heart and you know it's the word and you've anchored on it and you, you stay with it and God, you are praying about something and he's made you a promise. There's a principle in the word of God that leads to the window of faith. 
But when God makes a promise to someone whose heart is set on him, he immediately sentences it to death. He, he puts it, he rolls in death upon that promise. And that death, that sentence of death is upon all human means of fulfilling the promise. He rules in death upon every human possibility. You, you find it with Abraham. He's, he's given the promise uh, years before he uh, <clears throat> comes into the fullness of that promise. He's given a promise that he would be the father of nations, that out of his loins would come kings. And that promise was given to him. And we know at that time, it seemed the most opportune time, that would be called the window of opportunity, but it was not the window of faith. The, the, he, he was he, he still, his forces weren't obeyed because he gave, birth to, uh, he gave birth to Ishmael during his time. So even prior to that time, God had hinted and given to him a clear word, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to be your shield. And he made these promises. And then he rolls in death. There's a sentence of death. He waits until the womb is dead. Sarah, he, he waits until uh, Moses' uh, forces, human forces are uh, uh, abated. And he waits for that time and at 99 years of age after many testings and what I call eclipses of faith. Because Abraham had those eclipses. Twice God dealt with him after making him promises that he'd be a shield and nobody could touch him. Still, he, he asked his wife to pretend that she's her, his, uh, sister. He goes down to Egypt in fear after God said, this is your land and you have nothing to fear. I'll feed you. I'll care for you. And he, in fear and the human panic runs down to Egypt. And his wife ends up in harem. And, and so he, he, God was giving him these windows in which to exercise his faith so become stronger when the great tests come. And thank God he never stag he staggered in his early years, but he did not stagger when this ultimate promise comes to Abraham. But you understand that, that God sentenced it to death. Here he is. There is no possible way he can have a child. In fact, he's saying, God, I would, to God, I would that you would accept my sacrifice, accept the fruit of my loins, accept uh, Ishmael. And Lord said, no, that's not the promise. That wasn't what I told you. And he, he opens this window of faith until there is, God had sentenced to death every human possibility that that prayer could be answered. You'll find that in the life of Joseph, who's been given that mighty promise that, that the nations would bow before him, his brothers would bow before him, even his father would bow before him. And this, this, this was not a, something that uh, stroked his ego. This was something of the spirit God revealed to Joseph that he's going to have a part in God's eternal purpose in saving his people. And what happens? God sentences that promise to death. And what I'm talking about is not the promise that dies. What dies is all human hope, all human effort, where a man or woman is cast wholly upon the promises of God and nothing else. You live or die. You hang on it. You live by it. And you don't give it up. And, and this is how we become the friend of God. Uh, you, you see, I don't think God is looking for martyrs. Thank God for the martyrs. Thank God who lay their lives down. But in this day and age where there's such skepticism and there's fear on all sides, what is needed, not martyrs who, who would be known in a small circle, but those who are in the fight, those who face impossibilities, those who've had the sense of death and they live through it and it's a testimony and they don't lose that. They become friends of God and God begins to reveal his mind and his heart to them because they have determined I don't understand anymore, Lord. You don't have to explain to me. I need no more explanations. I don't know. I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why my family goes through it. I don't know why all the people around me are suffering as they are who are holy and godly. 
And Lord, they may doubt you, but I will not. I'm going to hold true that you are faithful, God. You know what it is. And if I don't know till I get to glory, so be it. Amen. Amen. Look at the death sentence upon all human possibilities in Joseph. He winds up in, in uh, jail. He's mistreated. And, and uh, humanly, it, 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 it got so severe, so hopeless that it, he, he, he says, finally, please have pity on me. He's talking to one of the many prophesied to who would soon be in the presence of the king. He said, remember, because I, I don't deserve what I'm going through. But it, it, in the final hour, in this, you see, the window of faith is when everything, everything, let me put it this way. If you can tell God how to get out of your mess, you're in trouble. I mean, you, if you have a plan, if you can sit down, you know, you spend the whole night and you wake up in the morning, get your pen and pencil, say, well, here's how you can do it. Look, I've done that in my lifetime. I've told God, this is easy. I know, I know who has the money. I, we need money in our ministry. If you'll just wake him up. If, Lord, he's got millions of dollars. I know he's got it. And I'm going to meet him tomorrow, but I don't want to ask him. But here's how you can do it. No, God's not going to do it until he puts it to death. Until death rolls in and he takes away from me any opportunity, any hope until I can't figure it out anymore. So, folks, why don't you go to sleep? You can't figure it out anyhow. <laughs> David told he is king and he's anointed and the oil, unction, everything he had, this great promise. Yeah, yeah i tell you what... You talk about a man who saw death rolled in on the promise. Consider him hiding in the cave. Consider him before Agag and the spill running down his mouth. And he's pretending to be a madman now. And he's running for his life. And then the old devil comes along and said, some kind of king you are. Where is your promise? Where is the promise? Well, folks, God is at work. He's not looking for every human condition, every duck to be in place, and everything in order, and now's the time to move. That's how we think in missions even. Uh, you, you know, my, my great spiritual dream was, is to uh, build an orphanage and a small clinic for AIDS kids in Kenya. And then, just as we were making plans, and I, I felt the Lord speak to my heart about it. It wasn't something I wasn't going to name it after me or anything, but I just, I couldn't handle the poverty and, <clears throat> and so many AIDS kids dying and roaming about. And, and <clears throat> the, the whole nation erupts, and, and uh, they were chopping off heads in that area that we were going to work and God rolls in death but you see we, we think that the we, we we need windows of opportunity no in China God was moving when there was no human way when everything is in spiritually is in any open doors were closing and and persecution on all sides and we see countries even where brother Kushmik is is ministering in the Balkans and in Russia now and it, even in Ukraine and, and through uh, South, uh, South Africa where it seems humanly that the doors to the gospel are closing and the opportunities are not there anymore. But folks, God doesn't look at it that way. He doesn't look at, that, at it that way regarding missions and he does not regard it that way when he deals with our personal lives. And David it goes through this, and you find him finally at Ziglag, and they want to stone him. He's lost his family. He's lost everything. But David saw it as a window of opportunity, and he waited on the Lord, and he leaned upon the Lord. And David said, I'm going to trust God in this. And God said, because you trust me, I'm going to let you restore everything. You're going to get it all. 
rolled in death. You go to the New Testament and you, you, you'll find the window of opportunity. It, it, that window, or the window of faith, sometimes that it's just a, a few moments that that window is open. Remember, Jairus comes for prayer for his 12-year-old daughter who's stricken. And they come and say, uh, uh, she's dead. You see, death was rolled in on the promise. And, and they said, it's no use. The, baby, the child is dead. Don't bother the Lord. Don't bother him. And you know, you can come to that place where you, you don't complain to God. You don't murmur against him. But you've come to a place where you... Many of you here, you, you know, you would never say, I don't believe God doesn't answer prayer, but you, you think he doesn't answer mine. And, and the word is, the situation is too dead, don't, don't bother him. I'm not going to bother the Lord anymore. I prayed, I fasted, I did everything right, and it didn't happen. You see, God rolls in death, but the Lord turns to this man, and he, he said two, two, two words, only belief. Only believe. And God raises up that child in the hour of the, the greatest moment of death, despair, and hopelessness because he believed God answered. Hallelujah. I don't think we take seriously uh, this matter of total, absolute confidence in God. Can you believe that God is in your situation? I said again, can, can you believe wholly that, that uh, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ear is open to their cry, and the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose, who, whose hearts are right with him, were perfect before him, and that in, in the original you'll find those who have fully trusted him. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro, here and there, and finds, he knows, he's looking, he's looking now for, for those who will trust him, that he may show himself strong in their behalf. God is the one who brought Israel into this place of death at the Red Sea. He's the one who, who allowed the waters, even could have made the waters bitter to bring them this uh, window of faith where they where they would accept this and fall on their knees and say, well, we just saw what God did in Egypt. We saw what he just did here at the Red Sea. We're going to believe him. Where were the princes? Where were the elders? Where were those who say God is able? He's the God of the impossible. But no, that unbelief closes, slams, shut the window of faith. You can abort every promise God has made to you through unbelief. I, I, I preached a sermon here once uh, about God no longer accepts unbelief, the lie of unbelief, and uh, I, th I thought it was too strong, so I asked them at the table to take the sermon off. I'm, I'm going to ask they put it back on, because I was moving in the flesh. You see... Uh, uh, Promises given to Zacharias in the house of God. He said, "You're going to have a child, and he's going to be <clears throat> he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah." And the angel Gabriel comes to his to put it in a way we could always do his job site. He, he was ministered in the house of the Lord and priesthood, and the angel Gabriel stands before him and said. Uh, your wife's going to have a child. Your wife is going to have the child. The promise is there. And he, he aborts it through unbelief. He aborts that plan. Now, this is an angel. This is a Gabriel, and he, he acknowledges who he is. You know, a lot of people say they're angels, but there was something about this uh, appearance of theophany, and he said, you're going to have a child. And he... he he doubts it and he questions it and he says, how is that possible? How can that be? We're beyond all 
potential of having a child. Our forces are, are abated. The same situation, and here it is. And, and God didn't take lightly to that unbelief. He never does. Especially for those who have walked with him and known him and trusted him over the years. How that grieves the heart of God. How that wounds. I, if God has been speaking anything to me uh, so that it becomes part and parcel, 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 parcel of my very being, it, he has shown me his grief when I doubt him in the face of his promises. When, when after all the experience I've had with him, it, the, how, 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 Grieve, grieve not the Holy Spirit. It's, it's that grief. They didn't accept the promises. And, and God didn't say, well, yeah, you're, he's an old man, Gabriel. He, he's maybe forgetful, you know, like me now. Forget a lot of things that, as age creeps up. And he's been faithful over the years. Let's, let's, just, let, let's just let it go by. Let, let's just leave it at that. No. The angel of the Lord said, you're not going to be able to speak. And he was stricken. He couldn't speak. His tongue was tied for that whole period of nine months. And rather than go out of his, it was his custom to pr pronounce the blessing on the people. He could not pronounce the blessing. He had lost his testimony during this time. He had nothing to say. He had nothing to give. But silence and misery in his heart for his unbelief. You see, God doesn't take it lightly. Whatever you're going through, God has allowed it. And, and there, are, you see, you can lose battles, but you don't have to lose a war. There are times that, that we stagger, and there are times that we have these eclipses of faith. But there has to come a day. There has to come a day that no matter what it is, no matter how dark, and no matter how absolutely hopeless. And folks, this is not an imagined hopelessness. It's reality. The truth is there is no other way out. There's, there, it, but, but, but how God's heart is exhilarated, how God is blessed, how... He, he can point as he did to Job, there is my servant. Here's one who trusts me. And his eyes are finally fixed. God fixed his eyes in the Old Testament on King Asa. He was a righteous man who did that which is right before God. Clearly stated in the scripture. And he builds cities. He builds cities with towers. The economy is blessed and the people are blessed and and. Israel that's backslidden at the time, there's a great revival sweeps through Judah under King Asa, and uh, the idols are taken down, sodomy is outlawed, witchcraft is outlawed, a great moving of the Holy Spirit under this godly man who did right before the Lord, a praying man, and he was a believing man at the time, because suddenly out of nowhere, and this is what happens, you can have a telephone call, suddenly things change, suddenly there is a humanly impossible situation thrust upon you, uh, financially the job is lost in a moment and uh, things begin to happen and bad things happen to good people and out of nowhere there was a revival. This man was seeking God. And out of nowhere, a million-man army comes from Ethiopia. Now, this is to be a massive invasion of Judah. Judah was living under the favor and blessing of God. So no, you stop and question what you're going through. Well, is this the devil? Is this God? Is this happenstance or anything else? doesn't matter. God, God's overall. God is in control. He's in control no matter what. 
If, I, if I've sinned and something's happened, if I'm under the chastening of the Lord, I know that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And I know that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of love. And he has been sent by the Father through the Son on a mission of love. And I know no matter how he deals with me, I don't know what I go through, but I know the Holy Spirit who abides in me, he also loves me. So it's a love mission no matter what happens. So I can be at peace in my soul. I don't have to figure it out. I don't ask anymore. Now, I'm going to have to have the grace of the Holy Ghost to just back up what I said. <laughs> but I believe that. Asa looks at that million-man army, and he looks at his far less uh, powers and resources, and the Scripture said he called on the Lord. He said, Lord, with you, it doesn't matter whether there's many or if there's only a few with not strength, because you can do anything. And he called on the Lord, and God wrought a great victory because he trusted the Lord. See, what was the window of faith when everything looked hopeless? It wasn't an opportune time. It was an inopportune time. It was... But in God's mind, in God's eye, this is what I want. I want you, Asa, to believe me. Now, Asa goes on, uh, you know, a prophet, he's coming home from the great victory, and a prophet comes to him and says, now, from now on, and in essence, this is what he said, if you believe God the rest of your life like you've believed him now, God will bless you and favor you, and the anointing will be upon you, the nation will be blessed. If you with God, he's with you. If you forsake this, what he said, if you forsake this walk of faith and you start getting in the flesh, you try to figure it out yourself and you take matters in your own hand, God can't walk with you that way. And he was clearly warned. 36 years go by. 36 years, this man, you, you see, if we don't maintain faith, if we, we don't build up our faith, and we should do that in, in good times where every time you pay your rent, every time you pay a mortgage payment, you start thanking God. You start saying, Lord, you've kept me this far. You've made me, you, you've been with me. And every time you go to the grocery store and you pay that grocery bill, you begin to thank God and you, you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And you use those times to build up your faith and walk in thanksgiving and rejoicing before the Lord. Use these as opportunities to build the faith. The 36th year after, suddenly again, the Basha, the king of Israel, comes against Ramah, five miles from Jerusalem. And he sets a roadblock. He starts rebuilding the city as a fortress, a fortress to bring in his army. And now the trade routes are cut off. It's going to ruin the economy of, of Judah. It's going to, uh, it would collapse the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there would be starvation because uh, Judah depended heavily on trade at the time. And all the trade routes, all the caravans are stopped, everything. And everything comes to a standstill. Now, you see, God had been searching the earth. His eyes had been searching for this man. And, you know... God is searching now, right now. He's searching in this church. He's searching in this city and all over the world in this particular troubled time we live in, looking for, for that one, that woman, that man, that person that is going to trust him what is coming because the perfect storm will be upon them. But you see, Asa, at this time, decided to do it his way. He, he, he waited and God didn't act. So he goes into the temple where he went, used to go to pray. He goes into the house of God. But this time he doesn't pray. This time he's in panic. He's in panic. I, I've got to do something. And he looks at the gold uh, utensils. He looks at the gold everywhere in the altar. And he strips the gold. He strips the silver. And he collects 
through taxation, whatever way he did, and he took this fortune to the king of Syria. And in so many words, this is exactly what he said. And he would not call it a bribe, but that's what it is. And when you act on your own, it's a bribe. Trying to bribe God. And he, he takes that money and says, I'm asking you to break your treaty uh, with Israel. And I want you to deliver Rama. I want you to save me from my enemies. And a prophet comes to him. Now, it worked. It worked. But in God's eyes, he said, I can't walk with you anymore. And he sends a prophet to him. And he said, because you didn't rely on me, the Lord says, you're going to have wars the rest of your life. And what he's saying, you're going to die in misery. And that's what happens, my friend, and that's how serious this issue is. This is how serious I see it. It's as serious as God has made it to my soul. If God's made you a promise and you don't see it, it's an affront to God. It rouses, it right, it arouses in the Heavenly Father that same anger that came against Israel. And he said, be careful unless you doubt, unless unbelief comes into your heart. And he called it a wicked heart that would not trust him. Pray till you can't pray anymore. Read your Bible. Get under all kinds of stress uh, because you haven't read enough and get in there through stress or anything else or condemnation and read the Bible through and, and say your prayers in a, an unbelieving dead fashion. And all it, do, all it is is going to bring misery to your heart because you do not fully turn it over to him as hands with no explanation. All Asia had to do was believe and trust as he did. And that word, it may sting us, but I preach it to myself. This is not really a hard message. This is a life-saving message to us because he's giving, he's putting before us now a window of faith. And it's not the window of faith right now that I'm talking about does not have to do with the economy itself. I am going to talk to you for, for that for just a moment. There's a window of faith going to be presented to you and me. And especially in this, uh, this city, but around the world, every believer. There's coming, an there, there's coming a time when you are going to have to be so dependent, we are going to have so given to his word, that we can't be shaken because the perfect storm is already upon us. In March, Bear Stearns was on the brink of bankruptcy and the government guaranteed a loan, I think, of $30 billion. And the next day, the Wall Street Journal headlines 30 billion dollar uh, insurance policy and it, and it said in headlines nation saved 24 hours before financial ruin that's how close we came to a total collapse of our economy and folks i i have preached in this century I'm going to say this, and I'm not boasting. I have preached as many prophetic messages as any pastor or preacher probably in this century. I have notebooks full of prophetic sermons. I preached here the first year of this church, 20 years ago. <clears throat> in just the one year, there were over 20 prophetic messages. One was called The Self-Destruction of America. And I have warned and warned, and in the last prophetic book written 10 years ago about America on the brink of a financial holocaust, on page 28, I said the, the, the bond market is going to collapse. 
and I was mocked and ridiculed. No one would believe that the bond market in America could be affected. I warned about the fall of the dollar. I warned about a housing crisis and all of these things. All there, I can give you the page number. I was in it last week and looking over the prophetic word. And, and even reading it and reading some of the prophetic messages that I was preaching at that time, some of them were so strong. I, I, I said to myself recently, I, I wonder how many people left the church because it was too strong. Now, I'm not here to say I told you so. God knows my heart, not anything to do with that. But the real crisis is not yet come. It, it, it is coming, but the real crisis is going to come. And every one of us are going to be affected. Every one is going to have life changes. And it's dishonest if we as pastors don't warn you. This is going to get as far as what, as far as, as all human, there's, the very same principle upon which God works. God, before Jesus comes or before you and I leave this earth, he is going to have a people. He's going to have a wholly dependent people who live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And God is searching in these times when a perfect storm comes. Folks, we can't stop all this. There is a judicial blindness. A judicial, it's a judgment of God upon the politicians. And I, I say this kindly, but everyone that's running for president of the United States right now are making tens of billions and billions of dollars of promises, every conceivable thing. We're the number one debtor nation in the world. There's no possible way we can pay the debts we owe now. We owe China over a trillion dollars. It can't be paid. And in this madness, this absolute madness... They're making these promises of tens of billions of dollars and not one of them can do it. Not one of them will be able to change things. Those days are over, folks. And God has to have a people. If you're trembling in your seat right now, get a hold of the word of God. There, I, I'm going to be affected. Every pastor in this pulpit is going to be affected. And I know some people don't like to hear this anymore. But I, I, when I hear a friend of mine say, we, me and my husband, my husband and I are living in constant fear now, Brother Dave. We, we can't even turn the radio on anymore. We don't want to hear anymore. What, what, what's going to happen with our children? What's happened to our children? That's the question they ask in Israel. When they were in the wilderness, God brought us out here, and all, all our children are going to die of poverty. They're, go, they're going to starve, or they're going to they're, they're be in water, and they're, they're going to die of thirst. And God said, no, 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 wait a minute. Because of your unbelief, and I say this with a broken heart and a tender heart, the Lord said, no, no, no. Because you don't trust me, you are going to die in the wilderness. Now, one of you are going to go in. Your children are going in, and they're going to be prospered. They're going to be kept, and they're going to be blessed. Lay your children on the altar. Lay your job on the altar. Lay everything in the hands of Almighty God. Oh, what a faithful God we serve. What a mighty God. David said, I'm old and gray-haired. And he said this just before he died. And he'd been to all through one hell after another of discouragement and everything that can possibly happen to a man who walks with God and being tested. He said, I've lived a long time and I have gray hair. And I've yet to see God's people beg for bread. I've never seen it. And folks, I'll never see it. And if you walk with God, you'll never see it. God will make sure you, you're not out in the rain. He'll put a, something over your head. He'll have something on your back. He'll put something in your stomach. And if that's, if, if that's what it takes, God, in the midst of that, will have a bonded people. God will have some. Those are the good days, not not where we were prosperous. That's when we got lazy. But in these trying times, that's going to bring the body of Jesus Christ together in faith. This is the window of faith. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me, please?
There's a song we sing, Shake Off Those Heavy Bands. This is a church that was founded on the word of the living God. This is a church where the gifts have operated in spirit, and the spirit's gifts have operated freely. It's a church where God, in simple acts of mercy and love, has warned his people. And in that warning, you have to see the loving hand of God. God so loves his people. He sends watchmen and prophets. And you've heard these men, every one of these men in this pulpit, being used in those gifts of prophet, prophetic preaching and, and all. I'm just one voice. But he's waiting for you and for me to take that step. I've seen what faith can do. And like you, I'm being tested. Because I've never been tested in my life. I've heard Pastor Carter say that. I've heard it from other pastors here. And I I just... Sometimes I open up my heart too much. And I'm trying to pull back from that. But sometimes you just have to say some things. I have two daughters that had cancer over the years and were... God delivered them. But now both doctors can't find why they're so sick. Every test there is from spinal taps to everything. No very conceivable doctor you can think of. No explanation. None. But I see something. I see what God's doing in my daughters. The drawing out of their hearts and the beauty of Christ. So I'm, I'm obliged and, and just willing I step back and say, oh God, from now on let me say, not my will, but yours be done. Now, you have to say that. You have to say that in your situation now. Say it from your heart, Lord, not my will. But then hold to your promise. Don't let it go. But Lord, do it your way, in your time. And boy, I look over the years of my life and and all the times I worried in vain. Because while I'm worrying, God was already working out the problem. And I wasted my worries. Don't waste your worries. Don't worry. Don't waste the time. Jesus has you in his arms. He's never going to let you go. He's with you. Would you, would you sing this while I get the mind of the Lord for a closing word, please. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to every heart, those who step forward, and for that matter, every one of us in the house, speak to us. Holy Spirit, you do abide, and you're not a silent one. You speak. You have a voice. An old voice of the Holy Spirit, that loving voice, that that compelling voice in us that says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of freedom. Today is the day you can step out in faith, have your faith renewed and strengthened. Today is the day to cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Lord, I pray that everyone who came forward will have their heart desire met. Pray that everyone, Lord Jesus, will sense your presence right now.
that you know where they're at, you know what they're going through, that you would lift this burden, that they'll not take the burden out of this house, but lay it down at your feet right now. I want you to pray this prayer. If, first of all, if you know Jesus, don't pray this with me. Just for those who have grown cold toward the Lord or your first time, you want to give your life to Christ. I want you to pray this simple prayer because the Lord says, only believe, confess your sins and believe, and thou shalt be saved. Believe. And he will send the Holy Spirit to help you deal with your sins. But right now, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, let me hear it. Pray around. Dear Jesus, forgive my heart condition, my coldness, and my unbelief. I come to you, Jesus, to confess my sins and to believe, Jesus, that you're alive and that you love me. Forgive me and cleanse me and make me new. All right? And on the power of his word, I can tell you this. He heard that. And when he, we know if he hears us, we have the petition that we ask of him. Now, the rest is to your, up to your part. We, we can't put under your, in your hands directions on what church to go to or anything else, but you're, you're most welcome here for a new believers meeting. I want the rest of you that have come, I don't know why you came forward. That's between you and the Lord. But will you pray this prayer loud and clear? Lord Jesus, I want to trust you in all times. Lord Jesus, be my everything. By faith, I cast my problem. I cast everything into your hands because you care for me. And I accept your love. I accept your promise. Now heal my spirit. Take all fear out of my heart. You have not given me the spirit of fear, but love and the spirit of power and faith. Thank you, Jesus. Begin to thank him right now. God, remove all fear. Sound mind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.